turning to Romans 3. We've been gone away from Romans for a few weeks and kind of getting camp in and kind of sidetracking, but it's always good to sidetrack a little bit and see what else God has. But boy, Romans 3, uh, the book of Romans is just outstanding. And every time I, I, I study for it and read about it, it just opens my eyes even greater. And I've, I told you when we started this a few weeks back that I think every Christian needs to read Romans probably once a year just to keep us focused and keep us where uh, understanding how great God's grace is, how big and huge it is, how, how lost we were, but how much he loved us to, to reach down and grab us and, and bring us up. You know, we kind of think that, well, when I was, you know, in my life and things, we kind of look at it sometimes like, you know, there's people out there way worse than I was. And, you know, some people out there are so mean and so ornery and done some terrible things. God had to reach way down in the bottom to pull them out of the miry clay and set them on the solid rock. But you know what? He had to reach just as far down to get me and you as he did any other person because we were all totally lost. We were totally lost without Christ. And there wasn't anybody that was halfway lost or because you're either totally saved, you're either totally lost. And so when he reached down and saved us and when he pulled us out of that miry clay with his great grace, guys, he had to reach just as deep for me and you as he did anyone else because we needed a Savior. We were lost. And so it's awesome to think about Paul's still kind of answering questions in, in Romans. He's, Paul kind of, he, he knows his audience. He knows he's talking to the people here in Rome. He knows that some of them have been kind of besieged by some of the, 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 the Jewish leaders and Jewish people that have come and said, look, now, you, now that you've given your heart to Jesus, you need to be circumcised like us. You need to look like us. You need to act like us. And Paul's saying, no, it's, it's by grace and grace alone. And, and so they're really confused about some things. So Paul's trying to, to look at some of these objectors, some of these folks in the crowd, not so much the, the Christian, but folks that's got all these questions about, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't, think that's, I don't think you can be saved without having works. and I don't believe you can be saved if you don't do this or you don't do that. And Paul's trying to think of every question they might have to answer that for them, and he does a, a great job of that. So let's look at, at three and... and uh, you know, he's been teaching that, uh, that, that there's, no, there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, and he's been teaching that we're saved by grace, and God's one God, God for all of them. And so the Jewish people are kind of, they're, they're kind of sticking in their head, and, and people are thinking, also these, these Roman people are going, whoa, wait a minute now, uh, I, I, wasn't, wasn't the Jews, aren't the Jews God's chosen people? Uh, you know, and, and so Paul kind of takes up with that question and, and talks about salvation by grace here as we go into to Romans 3. It says in Romans 3 verse 1, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way, Paul says. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were faithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human be a liar. As is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Now, let's go back to verse 1. What advantage is there, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Now, many of you know that, that God kind of made a, a covenant with the Jewish people, uh, with Abraham, and, and, and that covenant, is, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, that covenant still, that promise is still yet to be fulfilled totally. And, and God's going to, he's going to fulfill that promise. But one of the things they did by faith, okay they didn't have jesus on the cross yet all right they were looking forward to that and god gave them multitude of things in the old testament the old testament is pointing everybody toward the cross and god gave the, the, the his chosen people multitude of things to point them to christ the the sacrificing of the lamb and and all those things that they would do that was they were they were behaving they were acting they were doing what god asked them to do we trust by by faith they trusted by faith. They trusted by faith in what God told them to do. We trust in faith that Jesus died on the cross. But when Jesus died on the cross, he also died for those people in the Old Testament and the New Testament and everybody that would come all right, after. And so here they are, and they've been asked to take this mark on their body. When you are a Jewish person, you are circumcised. You have this mark. And so it began to be you know, like, well, you're not one of us because you don't have this mark. And they began to put more faith in that mark than who the mark was about. It was because they were separated. They were sanctified. They were set apart as God's people. We have some of those marks today. We have baptism. 
When we give our heart to Jesus, we, we mark ourselves. We, we stand up and say, I'm going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. I've given my heart to Jesus. Salvation is in, in God and through Jesus and Jesus alone. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be baptized. And so we, we died our old way, we rise again to our new way, and we walk into a new life. And that's our mark. We take that mark. Another one of the marks we have today is church membership. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, when we're baptized in the, in, the, in the believer's water there, then when we come out, we are a member of the local body. We're a member of the church. Not only this local body, but we're a member of the, the church of God, the big church of God that we'll all be a part of someday when we get to heaven. And so we have those marks. But what we have to be careful about is that we don't put so much faith and trust in the marks rather than the one whose our faith and trust is in is Jesus Christ. Because sometimes, just because we have the marks, it can lead us to believe that we have something we don't have. And the Jews were like that. It started them believing they had something they didn't have. They thought, as long as I have the mark of circumcision, I'm good to go. As long as I'm God's chosen people, I'm good to go. But he still required faith in Jesus. He still required faith in God so that they could come to know him as Savior. And so, listen to me this morning. Make sure, make sure that your faith is in Christ. Because we're not saved by our faith. We are saved by our faith in Christ. It's not, it's not the object, it's not our faith, it's the object of our faith. Listen to me, I, I, try, I try not to confuse because that's, that's something we don't think about a lot. But, but why we're saved is because we put our trust and faith in a person. That person is Jesus Christ, and his blood was shed to forgive of our sins. And so it's very important that we understand that must be first. That must be first. Don't look to your baptism as that why I'm going to heaven. Don't look at your church membership as why I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven if your faith and trust is in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why you're going to heaven. Now, these other things are great. Baptism, church membership, it's kind of like a badge. You know, a, a policeman wears a badge. Let you know he's a policeman. We have these badges. We are being baptized. We are church members. But you know what? Listen to me, guys, real carefully. If we have those badges and we're out here dishonoring God, if we're not faithful to God, if we're not doing the things we should for God, we dishonor those badges. They go from sacred to, to something that's not very pleasant. And so, guys, listen to me. When we put on our badge through baptism, through church membership, we should wear that badge with, with pride, not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ. And we should also realize that my purpose is to live for the Lord no matter what. And it's very important that I do that. So, the Jews and Paul saying, you know, you, know, you guys kind of get off on these marks, but there is value in being a Jew, all right? Much in every way. I ask you this morning, you think God still has a future for Israel? You better believe it. If you look at Revelation, Revelation is mainly all to the, to the Jewish people. And you know, I, I don't know if I ever really thought about it before. I, I think I knew it, but, but the way the writer put it this week as I was studying this, he said some people believe that here over here was a promise to Abraham, and then, you know, the promise of Christ coming, and then all that promise just kind of dissolved into the New Testament, and then we kind of go from there. But you know, there's nothing said about the church in the Old Testament. There's nothing said about that. That's all in the New Testament. And you know what? God's going to keep the promise that he made in John 3, 16. Y'all believe that? God's going to keep that promise. What's that promise? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. He's going to keep that promise for everybody that does that. But also, let's don't forget that he's also going to keep that promise he made to Abraham and to his chosen people. He's going to keep that promise. That promise is yet to be fulfilled. He's promised them the holy land. He's promised them the promised land. They have never inhabited all of the promised land that God gave them. We've been studying that in Deuteronomy. They will inhabit that someday. They will be brought together, and, and, and they, will be, they will be set up. That their promise was of a kingdom, a coming kingdom. Our promise is of a coming kingdom. But God said his chosen people would be, be on over that, that coming kingdom. Now, we kind of think, ooh, that kind of makes me mad. Didn't they, weren't they unfaithful to God? 
Didn't they turn their back on God? You mean he's still going to keep their promise? His promise to them? You mean God's still going to be faithful even though they weren't faithful? You better believe it. Listen to me. Aren't you glad that God's still faithful when we're not faithful? Amen? Amen? I'm glad. I don't look at that as go, well, he, they're getting preferential treatment. I'm just glad to be at the, at the party. You know what I'm saying? But God's going to keep his promise to the Israelites. And so that's what Paul's trying to pull all together here in Romans. He's trying to get them to understand, yes, you're very important. But then he'll get to the end of the letter and he'll say, look, but remember, there's only one God. And he's the God of the Jews and the Gentiles. He's the God of everyone. And so he's really, he's really working with them here. He's going to keep those promises. Much in every way, verse 2. Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Do you realize if it wasn't for the Jewish people, we would not have the word of God today? Moses, those that wrote the, David wrote the Psalms, all the minor and major prophets, they were inspired by God. They wrote the words down. And because of the Jewish people, we have the word of God today. Very important. They brought us the word of God is what Paul's saying. But what if some were unfaithful? That's what we're talking about. Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? What if the, kind of going back to that one more time so we really grasp that. Weren't the Jews unfaithful? Yes. Didn't they turn their back on God? Yes. Didn't they worship false idols? Yes. But you know what? God's going to still keep his promise because he's faithful. Let's kind of bring it over to our, our way a little bit. Haven't we turned our back on God from time to time? Don't say amen, say oh me. Yes, we have. Haven't we worshipped false idols from time to time? Yep. Haven't we done exactly opposite of what God asked us to do a lot of times? Yep. Aren't you glad he's still faithful? Amen. Makes that song, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, a little bit bigger, doesn't it? Makes you think about how great he's faithful. Man, isn't that something? Paul's, Paul, Paul's preaching the word, man. This is good. Not at all, verse 4. Let God be true and every human be a liar. Let God be true and every human be a liar. Did you know when people do not receive Jesus as Savior, they make God out to be a liar? What they're saying is this. God's plan of salvation is flawed, it's wrong, and it's not for me, even though God says it's for everyone. You know, God says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. We learned this morning in our class that God sent his only son. He sent his only son to die for all mankind. And when you say, that's not for me, when you say, I don't want Christ, when you, and that's what you're saying when you don't want to be saved. You're saying, I don't want Christ, I believe this is a lie, I believe this is wrong, I believe this is not for me. And that's what you say when you say, I don't want to receive Christ as my Savior. And you're saying God's plan, is it, it's just messed up. It's the wrong plan. And what did Gary say earlier? God knows everything. He knows everything. How could God be wrong? He's not. But that's what we say when we reject his word. When we reject his plan of salvation. When we say the way he did it through Jesus Christ and the shedding of blood and all that, it's not, we make God out to be a liar. Let God be true and every human being a liar. That's what it's talking And as it's written, so that you may be proved right when you speak, and prevail when you judge. Prevail when you judge. Let's move on to 5 through 8. But if our unrighteous brings out God's righteousness more clearly, listen, listen to this thought. Here's, here's the next question. This is something that we would ask. This is just what human beings would ask. Listen to this question. What if some were, un, uh, see, I'm sorry, 5. But if our righteous, unrighteous brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Paul says in quotations, I'm using, using a human argument. He wants you to realize this. And listen, this is inspired by God to put this in here. This isn't just some random thought that Paul had. But here's a person sitting here, and, and, and they're listening to all this, and they're, they're lost, okay? And Paul's trying to, to, trying to figure out what question they would ask. And here's what he asks. If God is righteous, if God is all-powerful and God is perfect, then, then doesn't me being unperfect make him that much greater? So... Wouldn't it be great if I just go out and sin and that shows you how much great, more faithful God is? Now, isn't that a ridiculous argument? That's, that's the argument that Paul's, and that's what people are arguing with. Well, you know, really, if you think about it, the, the worse we are, the greater God looks. And God never intended that. He intended us to find Christ, to, to come to him as Savior. 
to come to him and let him change our life so that he could bring us and set us on that solid rock so he could give us a home in heaven so he could make us redeemed and, and bought back and purchased back so we could have that close, intimate relationship with, with Jesus Christ all the rest of our days. What, what an argument. What an argument. That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us. Here's the next part of that crazy question. So here's the thing. I'm a sinner. So, and God's holy, and I'm not. So isn't God unjust by just judging me? No, he's not unjust. Now, I, I believe this. I believe he would be unjust if he never sent Jesus Christ. And really, really well, well, let me stop. I'm stopping right in the middle of my, my thing here, my thinking. Y'all ever think on the go? You know, it's kind of dangerous. But you know what? We, we were right with Christ in the garden, amen? We were perfect in every way. And we decided to sin. We decided to go 180 against God. And so really, God would be just if he just said, that's it. I give you your chance. And you, you, you give it up. He would be just in just saying, that's it, no more chances. He, he made us perfect. He gave us every. The Bible says they had everything they could possibly need in the garden. Everything. And they still turned their back and chased their own dreams, their own pride, their own selfishness. I want, to be, I want it to be about me. This is about me. That's what Eve was saying. This is about me. What's the world saying in 2015? It's about me. It's about me. But you know what? God is so just and such a perfect judge that he sent his only son to come and pay the price for our sins. And someday at the end of time, when all are judged, at the great white throne judgment, it will be everybody that's never received Christ. Everyone that's never received Christ will stand before Christ, and they will be judged justly. Because they had every opportunity that every Christian has. Because it's being proclaimed loud and clear. It's being proclaimed loud and clear. There's a verse in, in Acts 17, 30. It's not on the board, guys. It says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Think about that. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Preachers across the country today, across the world, are standing in pulpits and proclaiming that Jesus saves. Sunday schools are telling us that Jesus saves. Missionaries are proclaiming Jesus saves. TV, satellites, radio, cell phones, Facebook are proclaiming that Jesus saves. The word is going out in volume more than ever before that repent, Jesus saves. And still, people reject the word of God. And the Bible says, at one time, he overlooked such ignorance, but he doesn't anymore. And he's given everyone the command. This isn't a, you know, salvation is, a, is an all or nothing thing. If you'll just be totally honest, salvation is you're either all in or you're not in at all. Christ said, this is the way, this is the plan. This is the way you go. It's through my son. He's the only way. He's the only way to find forgiveness of your sins. There is no other way. There's no other name under heaven by which one must be saved but Jesus Christ. And if you don't follow that plan, you're not going to get to heaven. You say, well, that's kind of narrow-minded. Nope. I don't think so at all. Guys, we are in a world that wants details. We are in a world that wants a specific plan. We have kids that want to know just exactly how it's supposed to be. We adults want to know just exactly how it's supposed to be. But I, for some reason, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life, and there's no other way to heaven but through me, that blows our mind, and we get mad about that because there's got to be another way to heaven except through Jesus. But every other thing, we want to know exactly the details. I want to know, is that the, you know. If you ask me, how do I get to St. Louis, Brother Todd? Well, just go out here at the road and, 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 and go that way. Now, what kind of directions is that? That's what the world has. That's how the world wants to know to go to heaven. I'm, I'm telling you, that's how they want to know how to go to heaven. Just go out there and, and figure it out on your own, and, and maybe you'll get there. Does that scare y'all? Would you want to depend on getting to heaven that way? Not me. Jesus said, there's a way. It's through my blood. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
and no man comes to the Father except through me. Can't get there any other way. You can't get there any other way. Now, there's some different ways to go to St. Louis, by the way. There's only one way to go to heaven, and it's through Jesus. And that's what Paul's talking about here, guys. Verse 7, someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's faithfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And that's, does that not sound like our world today? Let me read that one more time. If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, if, if my wrong makes God that much more right and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? You know what that sounds like? I make God what he is. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Isn't that sad? It's sad, but it's, it's funny too. What, what Paul's saying, those people are standing up and saying, you know what, because of who I am, God is so glorious. Because of my rotten, sinful nature, God is so glorious. Guys, let me tell you something. God was glorious before we even entered the picture. God has been high and lifted up, and he is gloriful and, and wonderful and Savior and Lord and God and holy and all those things that we can, I can't even get enough words out to explain the the greatness of God, and it, it is none of us because of us. But I will say this, that we have something to count on because of God living in us. It works the other way around. We are, we are powerful. We are mighty. We are Christians. We are on our way to heaven not because of who we are, but because of who God is. That's where it comes from. Such, such questions that Paul's dealing with, and guys, I'm telling you, in 2015, we're dealing with some of these same questions. Verse 8, why not say, as some scientists claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. Paul said, look, when it comes time for them to be judged, it will be a just, it will be a just thing. They're going to get what they deserve because God has provided a way. He has provided a way. Then he gets to this. What shall we conclude then? Verse 9, do we have any advantage not at all. <laughs> See, these guys in these last six, seven, eight verses here, they want to think, oh, well, maybe there's an advantage for the human. We have, no, we have no advantage. We have no hope except for Jesus. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Isn't that something, that we are under the power of sin? Everyone that sits here and hears my voice this morning, everyone around this world, even that little bitty boy I held this week at seven pounds, I thought about as I held him, he was about a day and a half old. I said, man, what will this little guy see? But you know, even that little boy, as pretty as he was, is still under the power of sin. Now, I believe God will take care of him to a certain age. But he is under the power of sin. There's four ways that man's under the power of sin. First of all, man is a sinner by act. We've committed sin. Man is a sinner by nature. You know, we don't slowly build up and one day we're a sinner, all right? If you commit ten sins, then you become a sinner. We, we are a sinner and have sin in us from the very beginning. Number three, man is a sinner by imputation, which means we are a sinner because of Adam. Remember the Bible says because of one man, Sin entered into the world, Adam. And also the estate of man is under sin. We live in a world that is full of sin. It's under the prince of darkness. It's under sin. The entire human family is under the power of sin. Does that, my, does that not make you stop just a minute and say, it's hopeless then. You know, take away for just a minute that you know there's a Savior. But if we just stopped right here, if the Bible stopped right here, it'd be miserable, wouldn't it? There would be no hope. Paul reads further. Verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. No one righteous, not even one. Paul's kind of took us into the courtroom right now. He's going he's to show us some things that we're, what the judge says. When God looked down before he sent his son, and really before time even began, you know, I heard a great quote this morning 
It said, before God said, let there be light, he said, let there be the cross. Think about that. Before he even switched on the light, he already planned a way of salvation for me and you. Isn't that something? God looked down, he said, there's not going to be anyone righteous. No, not one. Something's got to be done. Verse 11, another charge. There is no one who understands. And listen to this next word here, guys. There is no one that seeks God. I do, Brother Todd. No, you don't. Not without God in you. There is no one that seeks God. You know, if it would have been left up to us, we would have never went and found God. After Adam and Eve, I don't think we would have ever went back and tried to find God. Remember where they were after they sinned? They were hiding, weren't they? God come to the garden. Look who come looking for him. God. Did he know what had just went down? Yeah, he did. But he came looking for him. Aren't you glad this morning if you know Christ as Savior? Aren't you glad he come looking for you today? Aren't you glad he come looking for you? Because we weren't going to go look for him. Yeah. And I know this all seems gloomy, but he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna change gears here about verse 21. We probably won't get there today. He's going to change gears here. But guys, again, Romans is about knowing how lost we were and knowing, how, knowing our position now through Christ and realizing how great his grace is. This is a grace thing, guys. It's no other way. You can't live good enough. You can't go to enough Sunday school. You can't do enough good things. You can't give enough money. You can't do enough good things. You can't do anything to get yourself to heaven. It is solely by the grace of Jesus Christ. And anything that we think we add to that, we're fooling ourselves. We are fooling ourselves. We don't even seek after him. Paul said, do you realize that none of us seek after God? You go away, go away from your Bible and go away from church and just watch where your mind goes in the next month. Two months, three months, six months. Watch, watch where your mind goes the minute you walk out this door. There is no one that seeks God. But because of him loving us and saving us and putting the Holy Spirit in our life, that Holy Spirit guides us and directs us and pushes us and drags us sometime to the throne of God where we can find forgiveness and peace. Isn't that amazing? All have turned away. They have turned together. They have, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Here's, here's the sad part, too. We can't even help each other. <laughs> we can't even help each other. Now, we can after God. Remember, these verses are before we find Jesus as Savior. Before God, we're not even going to help each other do right. We're going to gang up in a pile and we're going to do wrong. We're going to gang up in a pile and we're going to revolt about something. We're going to gang up in a, in a pile and we're going to pick it about something. All have turned away. They've together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And if we stopped right there, guys, in the courthouse of God, we would say, they would, the gavel would drop. Guilty. Guilty. Every last one of them. Now, real quick, before we close, Paul's going to pull us over to the clinic. He's going to take us over to the spiritual clinic. Now, what's the first thing the doctor does when you go in there and get a checkup? Open your mouth. And he sticks that stick in there, and I gag every time. I hate that thing, man. Blech. But he sticks a stick in there. Show me your tongue. Look what Paul said. Look, we're going before the great physician. He says we're sick. We're sin sick. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. You know what, we, you know what God's seen before we're saved, before Jesus came into our life? When we open our mouth, it's like he smells dead, rotting corpses coming out of our mouth. You know, somewhere in the, in, in the annals of time, mankind got the idea that, you know, I'm a pretty good guy, and, and God saved me because I, I was pretty good. I was worth saving. No, we weren't. The only reason that God came to us with his son Jesus is because he loves us, because of his great love. 
There's no one sitting here this morning from the pulpit on down that had, had any inkling that God should save them because they're a pretty good guy or a pretty good gal. He said, you open your mouth and it's just like dead, rotting corpses. It's, it's just stench. And that comes from a word, if you do a study, it's kind of like rotten fruit. Brother Hale brought us some watermelons this week. Boy, that was good. But in the middle of them was, was there was one rotten one, and it, it broke open, and ooh, it stunk. So what I done is I put it in a trash bag and threw it out there in the, in the garbage. Well, Friday, Gina come to take out the trash. And she was just going to move that bag over to the other thing because it just one bag. It blew up on her. I kind of planned it. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But she said it stunk. You ever smelt rotten stuff? You ever smelled roadkill? Stinks. God said that's, that's the way we are without him. We smell like rotten fruit. We can't, we're not going to bear good fruit. You know, last week we talked about if we're in the vine, if we're in the branch, we're going to bear good fruit because we're in Jesus. But before Jesus, all we could bear was rotten fruit. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. Man, I tell you what, there, there is nothing more vicious than a tongue. What's he say the next thing? Their tongues practice deceit. Their, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Now, one place I don't go at the zoo is the snake house. I hate snakes. I went in there when I was a little boy, and it marked me for life, you know? I, I, I would get Gary where I'd go and, and just kind of look in there first so I could see where he was, because you'd go up there real close, and all of a sudden he'd be right there. Oh, you know, i just get, give you the willies, you know? And you'd look at some of them poisonous snakes, and you can imagine the venom that would go into your body if they bit you. And God says that our tongues and our lips are just like that. With one, one blow of our lips, we can ruin someone's reputation. With one bro, blow of our lips, we can ruin our testimony. With one blow of our lips, we can run down God's house and God's people. People that are a part of our own family. He said we're vicious people. We're vicious people. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now you go, Brother Todd, that's pretty, that's pretty dark. That's pretty terrible. But if you'll come back the next time I preach, I'll get you to the good news. But we need to know the bad news so we appreciate the good news that much more. And the good news is Jesus saves and Jesus makes us a brand new creature in him because we stink. We stink. Paul said you all stink. And without God, we are nothing. If, if you want to see a difference in what God makes, read those verses and then go over and read about the armor that God puts on us. He says their feet does not, you don't know peace, and what does he do? He shods our feet with peace. He changes us. He, we do a 180 when we come to know Christ. It's a remedy for our soul. We've seen the great physician this morning. We know what's wrong with us. We know we stink. But God says there's hope. There's Jesus Christ, my son. And I'm screaming it out for all to know that repentance is available forgiveness is available my son paid the price for you and I can make you brand new if you'll just ask me if you'll just ask me with your head bowed and your eyes closed I ask you this question this morning do you know Jesus as Savior and if you do please thank him right now for saving you because this was our future without him. And for those that don't know, or for those that know they have not been saved yet, would you please come to know him today? Don't make God out to be a liar, because that's what you say, is God is a liar, and this plan is not for me, and God doesn't have the only way of salvation. And guys, he does. He has the only way.
the only way for us to be right is through Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, just speak to hearts this morning. Lord, help us to thank you. Help us to glorify you more for what you've done for us. Lord, we have such a tendency to put it on autopilot or cruise and just cruise through this life, and we never stop to just thank you for saving a wretched worm like I am. Thank you for saving me, God. Thank you for giving me eternal life. I so didn't deserve it. But God, you are so kind. And you love us so much. And Lord, my heart goes out to anyone here today that doesn't know you as Savior. That they would understand today their life can be changed forever and ever. Not for a week or a day, but forever. Lord, you deal in forevers, not in a moment in time. You deal forever. Lord, speak to hearts this morning as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, the music begins to play. If you've never accepted the invitation of Christ, would you do that this morning? Some prayer partners will be here with us. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, Check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street. Or give us a call at 870-526-2604. Or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you. So